Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Mohammed Asad Heather, and today I'll be presenting the paper titled uh, A Robust Volumetric Transformer for Accurate 3D Tumor Segmentation. Uh, they, these are the authors, and they uh, are from Monash University in Australia. Um, this paper was uh, presented at the Medical Image Computing and Computer Assisted Intervention Conference in 2022, and so far it has accumulated uh, 38 citations. I have provided the paper link as well as the uh, link for the code. So uh, the problem that this paper addresses is automated uh, brain tumor segmentation from 3D MRI data. And the objective is to uh, closely match the ground truth uh, manual segmentation masks, which are provided by human experts. And uh, apart from just matching the manual segmentation mask, the ground truth, the model also needs to be robust against artifacts. Um, next, we look at why uh, this problem is important to address and how it can help the doctors in the diagnosis process. Um, automated uh, tumor segmentation can help in the early detection of cancerous growths, uh, enabling the doctors to provide early intervention uh, and improve the patient's outcomes. Um, it is much faster and cost effective than manual segmentation, and uh, it provides a more comprehensive and detailed view of the tumor in the 3D space, enabling the doctors to better understand its location and relationship within the structures in the body. Um, it can aid in the planning of surgical interventions, radiation therapy, and uh, chemotherapy, and also to monitor the changes in the tumor size and shape over time, uh, enabling the doctors to assess the effectiveness of the treatment uh, and make the necessary adjustments. Um, so in order to fully understand the proposed network architecture, I thought it would be better to first do a quick revision of all the building blocks of the network. The first and most important component is the self-attention mechanism, uh, as it allows the model to focus on different parts of the input sequence uh, to compute a representation for the given uh, input element. So one of the key advantages of using self-attention is that it allows the model to capture long range dependencies in the input sequence. Um, and this is one of the main motivations of uh, the proposed approach in this paper, as the authors want to do away with convolutions, which are usually more, uh, they, they usually capture local features and um, attention is, uh, is very good at capturing long range uh, dependencies in the input uh, features, basically. So as can be seen um, in the image, first the input sequence is converted into three matrices, the key, uh, sorry, the query, the key and the value. And then the attention weights are computed using the following formula. So uh, in the practical sense though, uh, multi-head attention is used more commonly. And so how it differs from uh, this normal at attention mechanism. So there are different key and value, key, uh, key value and key repairs uh, for both, uh, for the different heads in the network. And uh, so each head then performs its own attention computation on its corresponding subspace of the input sequence, uh, resulting in a set of intermediate representations. And these intermediate representations are then concatenated and passed through a final linear layer to produce the output of the multi-head attention mechanism. Um, next, we look at the vision transformer, which applies the transformer model to images. And the way it does this is by dividing the image into equal size patches which are then fed into the transformer model through a linear projection and by combination with some positional encoding. Uh, in this way, self-attention is computed on these image patches and which allows the model to learn the long range dependencies and structures which are uh, not possible through a purely convolutional approach. Uh, but the problem with vision transformers uh, is that since the attention computation has quadratic complexity with respect to the size of the input, the uh, vision transformer suffers in performance for large images because as the number of input patches increases, so does, so does the complexity. Um, so also the patches that are computed in the vision transformer do not overlap. So the information from adjacent patches, which might be linked, is not captured. 
So the swing transformer basically extends the original transformer by introducing a hierarchical architecture that operates on multiple levels of the feature map. Instead of processing the entire image at once, the uh, swing transformer applies self-attention to uh, local patches of the image. So basically local attention is computed uh, from the adjacent uh, patches in the uh, image and it's not computed using all the patches. So that's why the, the complexity reduces to linear. So, and those uh, local patches are then further combined to form larger feature maps and then attention is computed over them. And this hierarchical approach then allows the swim transformer to process the images of arbitrary size efficiently. And another key difference between the transformer and the swing transformer is the use of shifted windows uh, in the swing transformer. Uh, this allows the self-attention mechanism to be applied to overlapping patches of the input. And this helps in capturing the fine grain details in the input data. Finally, we just have a quick look at the unit architecture, which consists of a contracting path and an expanding path, and which is typical of an autoencoder architecture. It uses convolutions, pooling, and upsampling layers to generate the segmentation map. So, so some of the related works in the field of medical image segmentation that the authors highlight include the uh, trans unit, which is basically a unit model with a vision transformer in its bottleneck layer. Uh, by the way, the bottleneck layer is the uh, this middle layer in the, the unit architecture. So, and another architecture is the SWIN unit, which is a purely transformer-based um, uh, architecture. An important thing to note is that both of these architectures operate on 2D data. So they take the uh, 2D slices from the 3D medical image data and then apply these algorithms, and these, uh, algorithms or networks to the data. Uh, then we have TransDTS, and it is one of the first works that operates on 3D data. And it is basically a 3D version of the trans unit architecture uh, as uh, it uses uh, 3D convolutions and the 3D vision transformer in its architecture. And finally, we have one of the state, art, state of the art models, the NN former, uh, which uses three twin transfer, uh, swim transformer blocks in its um, architecture. Finally, we uh, come to the proposed architecture of the paper, the volumetric transformer unit. And it is composed of uh, 3D SWIN transformers. And one of the main design choices of the authors is using cross attention in the decoder. I'll get back to this on, in more detail in the subsequent slides. And using this model, the authors achieve significantly uh, lower number of parameters and floating point operations as compared to other models. And they also surpass the state of the art models in terms of type and Hausdorff distance metrics on the uh, BRATS data set, and the model is relatively more robust than its counterparts. Um, this is the detailed view of the proposed architecture. Um, so uh, it basically, so this is the input volume with dimensions D cross H cross W cross P of the MRI data, and it is first passed through a 3D patch partition layer, linear embedding layer, then we have the encoder blocks, and then um, this 3D patch merging blocks decreases the, uh, basically decreases the height and width of the uh, input volume. And this basically follows the unit architecture approach. And finally, they, uh, this is the expanding part, which uses the decoder blocks as well as, and finally, there's a classifier at the end. I'll be discussing these components in more detail. So uh, first we had the 3D uh, partition and the linear embedding. Uh, so, so given a partition kernel with dimensions P cross M cross M, we divide the volume into tokens. And these tokens are computed. Uh, the number of tokens is given by this formula. We divide the depth by the P, the height and width by M. And this is the uh, floor operator. Uh, we project. So those tokens that we get, all of the tokens would have dimensions P cross M cross M. We project these tokens to a C-dimensional vector, uh, to a C-dimensional vector uh, through a linear embedding layer. So I will show this, demonstrate with this, and this with an example. If given an MRI volume of 64 cross 256 cross 256 cross one, we have a partition kernel of this dimension. We get the total number of uh, tokens by this division 
by a division of this volume by this, and it will come up, comes out to be 65,000 by 36. So if the linear embedding dimension is uh, 72, uh, an important note is that this linear embedding dimension basically determines the size of the whole architecture because they have they basically train two models. One is called the small version, and the other is called the big version. The small version has linear embedding dimension of 48, and this is the larger version with dimension 72. So, uh, so before the linear embedding, the tokens tensor shape would be 65,536 cross 64, and after the linear embedding, it would be a 72 dimensional uh, vector, uh, and this this will be total number of tokens. So next we look at uh, the encoder. So each encoder is composed of two parts. So the first part you can see on top, and the second part first is the window multi-head self-attention, as can be seen, WMSA. And the second is the shifted window multi-head uh, multi self-attention. And um, recall that in the window MSA, the multi-head self-attention, we have local patches on which attention is computed uh, as opposed to on all the patches. And in shifted window multi-head self-attention, the patches are computed by Shifting the windows accord uh, by shifting the window basically, um, yeah. And according to the authors, using both of these self-attention mechanisms in conjunction helps in capturing the long-range dependencies and leads to uh, better representation learning basically. Um, and before uh, the input is provided to each of these uh, modules, uh, layer normalization is applied to the input. The key. Uh, the key idea behind layer normalization is to normalize the input to each layer across the features dimension rather than across the batch dimension, as this helps the network to converge faster and generalize better. So yeah, these are the equations uh, that basically show how the data gets, um, so how uh, what uh, functions are applied to the data. First, this is the input from the previous uh, layer, previous encoder layer. We apply the la layer normalization to it, then the window multi self attention is computed, and this is the residual connection which is shown here. Then this, the output from this is passed to a multi layer perceptron, and again the residual connection is applied. The, the same process is followed uh, for the second module, but this time the shifted window uh, multi self attention is computed. And this way, uh, and this is basically the whole encoder block. The, uh, every encoder block is followed by a 3D batch merging block in which the adjacent tokens are merged along the width and height of the volume. Um, the depth remains the same and the merged token is projected via a linear mapping such that the uh, channel dimension is doubled. So an example, initial volume is 16, 64, 64. Volume after the 3D batch merging would be 16, Cross 32, cross 32, cross 2. As you can see, the height and width have been reduced by a factor of two, while the channel dimension has increased by a factor of two. So the overall volume remains the same, though. And the uh, authors say that the uh, reason for doing this is it reduces the floating point operations in the uh, in the encoder uh, in the attention computation by a factor of 16. So this huge-looking thing is the decoder block. So the uh, uh, the important thing to note is the decoder is everything to the right of this dashed yellow line. This is the decoder, and this is the encoder that we previously saw. And the reason for including this on this slide is uh, we'll clear soon. So first, let's just look and focus on the right side of this uh, decoder. It is exactly the same as this encoder path, but this time the information is flowing from the bottom to the top. It has the well, window, uh, uh, multi-head self-attention followed by a shifted window, multi-head self-attention, and this self-attention is being computed over here. So the decoder basically differs from the encoder due to, oh, sorry. Uh, I forgot to remove this. Just give me a second. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so this left side of the decoder in this 
although the structure is exactly the same, but in the sh shifted window and the and the uh, window uh, multi self attention, uh, we, uh, sorry, it's not self attention that's computed here. It's the cross attention that's computed. So how the cross attention is computed? It uses the query uh, matrix from the, the input that's coming in, but the key and the value matrices are used from the encoder at the same level as this decoder. So that's how a cross attention is computed in these blocks. And this cross at the end, the output from this block is merged with this output in the fusion, uh, you know, fusion, fusion module. And how it is uh, merged it is basically controlled by this alpha factor, which determines how much of each input is used in the final output from this block. And this uh, F over here represents the Fourier uh, feature positional encoding. And in this position, uh, encoding the position information is encoded using a set of learnable Fourier features, uh, which are used to represent the input positions as a function of frequency. Uh, the authors don't go into much detail why they use it over here and uh, why it's not used uh, uh, in the encoder and why it's only used in the decoder. But yeah. So the uh, Every decoder block is followed by a 3D batch expansion block, and it is the complete opposite of the 3D batch merging. It increases the dimensionality of the input token by two through linear mapping, and the resulting uh, volume is reshaped to reduce the channel dimension by half. An example, 16 cross 32 cross 32 cross 2, you get 16 cross 64 cross 64 cross 1. So the height and width have increased by a factor of 2, while the channel dimension has decreased by a factor of 2. So at the end, we have a 3D convolution layer, which maps the uh, features to a K segmentation mass. As can be seen, this volume gets converted to this. So each uh, voxel basically represents the, um, represents a class of it. So there are four classes in this uh, data set. The gray region basically denotes the healthy brain tissue. The yellow region shows the very tumoral edema. The green shows the enhanced tumor, red, the non-enhanced tumor, and the necrotic tumor. Um, I'll go over some of the training setup for this. They used 484 MRI scans from the MST BRATS data set. The train validation split was 8 between 5 They used a single NVIDIA A40 GPU with the following hyperparameters and the data augmentation for rotation, noise, blurring, and gamma. So um, I'll just quickly recap the evaluation metrics metri that they use. So first is the uh, dice Sorensen coefficient, or simply the dice coefficient. And it is a similarity measure that is commonly used in image segmentation. Um, it is a statistical measure that compares the similarity between two sets of data or objects. Um, and it is defined as twice the size of the intersection of two sets divided by the sum of the sizes of the two sets. So in our case, the sets and these sets represent uh, one of them is the ground truth and the other would be the output from the model. Um, one important thing to note is that it ranges from zero to one. Uh, zero being uh, no overlap, but one indicates uh, complete perfect overlap, and it is sometimes uh, re uh, represented with a percentage and with a single hundred. Next uh, evaluation metric that is used is the Hausdorff distance. So it is best explained through an example. Um, so given these four set of points, uh, if we assume that the blue points are the ground truth and the red points are the output from our model, we first compute the distance from point one, one to each of these points in the ground truth. So the distance between this point and this point is one, distance between this point and this one is 1.41. Next we compute the same distances from using this point. Oh, important, uh, and the minimum distance that we got was one. So distance from this point to this point is 2.24, distance from this point to this point, a point is 1.41, and the minimum distance would be 1.41. So the Hausdorff distance is basically the maximum of the minimum distances. It would be 1.41. The actual ma matrix that is used in the paper is the HD95, which is the 95th percentile Hausdorff distance. And it uh, differs from this in that it doesn't simply calculate the maximum value in the last step. It arranges the values in ascending order and then selects the 95th percent percentile value uh, um, since in this example, we have only two values, we can't actually do that. But uh, if, if assuming that there were 100 values and we arrange them in ascending order, we'll select the 95th value. 
And it is, uh, and basically they use this because it is a more robust measure of the similarity than the traditional OSPAR system, uh, which is less sensitive to outliers or small errors in the positions of the points. Um, so I'll quickly go over the experimental results. So uh, these uh, over here, WTETTC, are basically different combinations of the tumor uh, that uh, are part of the uh, classes, and they compute the AC95 uh, and the dice score. On uh, on these basically on the, on these tumors and they compared them with a lot of models, uh, a lot of the state of the art models, and generally they achieved the lowest HD95, the host of distance, and the highest chi score in uh, across all of these uh, matrix. As I mentioned before, the small version has a linear dimension of 48, and the bigger version has a dimension of 72. And the authors also perform a very small ablation study to show the importance of the Fourier positional encoding. So without it, the uh, AC95 matrix goes down from 87.1 to 85.35, and the dice score also uh, also increases. Uh, this also, when they uh, remove the cross attention, the you know, matrix and the performance also decreases further. Some qualitative results, given this crown truth, the VT unit uh, has a really good output. It very closely matches the crown truth, apart from this small uh, region over here, but generally it is much better than these two, the NN unit and the unit R. Uh, the NN former comes very close to the VT unit's output, um, as it also has the same uh, artifact over here. So the authors compare uh, do a robustness analysis with the NN former VT unit. So these are some of the artifacts that could be introduced in the MRI volume, and they usually occur due to equipment issues or movement of the patient when taking when doing the scans. And generally, the trend is that uh, the VT unit has more robust uh, output, basically for different uh, artifacts that were introduced. Um, this is uh, this diagram basically plots the dice similarity score against the number of parameters. And as it is clearly visible, the VT unit having the lowest number of parameters has one of the high, best performance in the, uh, among all the models. So some strengths of the paper, uh, the, design, the, the design choices are motivated, motivated by both accuracy and efficiency. So it's really good that they also focus on the number of parameters in the network. The architecture is very well explained in the paper and the intuitions behind the design choices are also clearly explained. And they achieve really good results even fewer parameters and the code is open source. Uh, some weaknesses, they don't usually uh, focus on why for your feature positions are, in are used in the decoder. Uh, it would have been nice to have uh, more intuition about why they were introduced in the model as well. Also, the, one of the biggest problems that I find is that the model is evaluated using only a single data set. And this uh, does not you know, basically show whether the model would be good for uh, other domains or other data sets as well. Like they could have done a CT scan version of the, uh, a CT scan experiments as well, but they only use the single MRI uh, and data set for this. And they used uh, convolutions in the classifier, so technically not a convolution-free architecture, and the authors emphasized that it's a, a convolution-free architecture multiple times in the paper. And the ablation study um, did have been more thorough. They only just show the Fourier position encoding and the cross tension. They could have included other features of the network as well. And the authors mentioned the reduction in flops but uh, there's, uh, there are no values nor comparisons which are provided in the paper. So rating, um, so I will give this a rating of three based on the adapted NIPS review ratings. Apart from the minor issue, the results are very good and the reduction in parameters is also impressive. But the, my biggest gripe with this paper is that it is evaluated on, on a single data set. Um, yeah, and future work could be basically um, using this model for other different types of uh, medical image data set apart from this uh, from the MRI scans. Oh, thank you, everyone. Okay, yeah, thank you, uh, Mohammed, for the uh, presentation. Very uh, you know detailed information uh, in terms of architecture and also the evaluation uh, metric. So I just want to highlight one um, you know maybe a couple of things. One is I think the major takeaway is the course. Uh, attention, 
uh, module they developed in this uh, paper because the swing transformer, the three version is, uh, I think it's pretty standard. They can using some off the shelf uh, network, but the cross attention is basically if you look at the QKV value, right? So yeah. you, can, you have a multiple branch or you have different layers, you can switch them. You so basically in this QKV value, actually you can switch from other branch or other block. So basically encourage the information flow from other places, right? Rather you from the same layer. Yeah. So this is, yeah. And this is uh, actually used a lot in some of the multi-model learning, right? So you have a, maybe have a text branch, you have a image branch and you have a audio branch, then you can using this cross attention to encourage these information exchange uh, across or among different branches. So that's one thing uh, I want to emphasize. So this is a very useful technique. So maybe in the future, if you guys develop similar uh, architectures, you can use cross attention, especially using these um, transformer. Um, another thing, uh, just general comment is, since you guys doing the assignment number two is focused on uh, segmentation, I want you to uh, learn some of the example from this paper, the, how, how they present the segmentation uh, result, right? They they highlight or enlarge some of the region to show how their method is, you know, perform well. So this is some of the technique uh, you can also consider when you prepare your uh, assignment two report, or maybe if you are writing a paper on this topic. Okay. So um, do you guys have any questions? Okay, um, if not, uh, thank you again. Uh, we'll move on to the last speaker. Okay, thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, cool. Let me get my screen up. Can you see it? Yes. All right, cool. So the paper I'll be presenting for today is Radiological Reports Improve Pre-Training for Localized Imaging Tasks on Chest X-rays. Um, and this is the team here. They're mostly from the Technical University of Munich, and then two of them are also in the Imperial College of London. Um, so the motivation for this, uh, the team noticed that there's been a lot of recent improvements in self-supervised learning and text-supervised learning. The authors noticed that a lot of the papers on these methods had a large focus on image classification downstream tasks and didn't often apply their methods to more localized tasks like object detection or semantic segmentation. So due to this, the team decided to test the effectiveness of these uh, self-supervised and text-supervised pre-training methods on more localized tasks. Uh, the main contributions of this paper is that they proposed an evaluation framework consisting of 18 localized tasks on chest x-rays. The framework is to be used for evaluating the performance of pre-training methods. Uh, they then used this evaluation framework and applied it to several different pre-training methods to compare the performance of a lot of the current state-of-the-art methods. Uh, so a lot of the related work, the paper had a lot of references for a lot of the current works in both self-supervised and uh, text, text supervised learning methods. So you can say a few here, like vertex, block text, and uh, the emerging properties in self-supervised vision transformations. Transformers. Um, so the, the evaluation framework, the way it basically works is that it uses a ResNet 50 convolutional neural network as the backbone for all the pre-training methods. The models are all trained on the same chest x-ray data set, and then after pre-training, the models are evaluated on semantic segmentation and object detection tasks. The models were all evaluated using three, three different settings based on the kind of tasks that they did. And so here you can see a list of the different pre-training methods they used. They started off with a random init, uh, randomly initialized one to use as a baseline. Um, they used an ImageNet one that was pre-trained on natural images to test the um, transfer learning capabilities. And then the rest were all trained on the chest X-ray data sets. And then here you can see the type of supervision they used. So the ImageNet and Chexpert used class labels the next three all did self-supervised learning, and then the last two used the radiology reports 
to do uh, text-based or uh, text-supervised learning. So the evaluation framework, the semantic segmentation task settings, uh, again, used a ResNet 50 as the backbone for them all. And it used a UNet fine-tune setting where it would tune all of the layers using a UNet architecture. Uh, UNet frozen, where the UNet, uh, the ResNet 50 portion backbone would all be frozen and everything else would be tuned. And then a linear one where a linear layer was trained and applied after the uh, last feature map and before the pooling layers. And then the object detection settings, um, again, a ResNet 50 backbone, but this time using a you only look once V3. Um, they had, again had a fine tune setting that tuned all of the layers, a frozen setting that uh, only did the ones that were not part of the backbone, and then a linear setting. And the, the reasons they gave for these choices were that the you only look once and the unit were comparable for the tasks and that the fine-tuned frozen and linear settings provided good coverage of the different extremes of the uh, settings that a person could use for them. The, uh, pre the pre-trained models are then evaluated on five different data sets of chest x-rays of varying sizes that included different tasks for object detection and semantic segmentation. And then after that, all the models were tuned to one task, the RSNA, you only look once V3, frozen 10%. Um, and here you can see the data sets. For pre-training, they used the MIMIC chest x-ray data set. And then for the downstream data sets, they used the RSNA pneumonia data set for object detection, the COVID rural data set for semantic segmentation, the SIM ACR pneumothorax semantic, for semantic segmentation, the object chest x-ray for object detection, and then the NIH chest x-ray for object detection with a lot of different uh, target classes. And in this, you can see that they have very different sizes for all the data sets because that was one of the things they wanted to look into. Um, and here you can see one of the charts for the results. Um, I figured this was the one that was the most representative of all the, uh, the results. And so they had the uh, generalized initialization methods, which were the random initialization and the image net. And in this, you can clearly see that the image net does better than random initialization. But when compared to all the ones pre-trained on the mimic chest x-ray data set, it didn't perform. It didn't perform quite as well. And then within the uh, the ones performed on the chest X-ray data set, they had ones that were perform uh, trained on thirty percent of the data set, and then ones trained on hundred percent of it. And you can see that the ones trained on hundred percent did slightly better. And the uh, they had mixed results, but for the most part, they found that the ones using the text supervised learning, which was convert and clip had a tendency to perform better on average. And you can sort of see that here. There were two other charts, but it was kind of hard to include all of them. Um, so the conclusion that they found was that the text supervised methods outperformed self-supervised methods in 13 out of the 18 tasks, but weren't better 100% of the time. So they concluded that this had to be, a lot of this had to come from the nuanced nature of the radiology reports. Um, so the strengths of this paper were that they used a lot of very comprehensive references, uh, which helped a lot for doing the research on it. Um, but that's kind of all it had going for it. Um, as far as weaknesses, they didn't give many reasons for why they did this or why it's important. It wasn't very novel. There wasn't a lot of novelty to it. They used methods that already existed and did tests and stuff that weren't very hard to do. Uh, the paper itself was not organized very well. It was very hard to find what you wanted to find in it or see what was actually important in it. They didn't provide any code. They provided very little in terms of figures and any kind of visual representations of what was going on. And then one of the bigness, biggest weaknesses, I think, was summed up by this quote from the paper that's towards the end where they said, we assume that benefits observed in our evaluation procedure also indicate benefits for tuned real world tasks, although they cannot be precisely quantified by our evaluation method. And I felt like this undermined the entire paper, given that the entire purpose of the paper was to create an evaluation procedure to help people figure out how good their pre-training methods are. And yet here they are saying that it doesn't really do that well. So my overall rating for this would be a five. It would be rejected. 
the paper just simply doesn't achieve its goal. That quote at the end just straight up admits that it doesn't work well at all. So I can't, I can't see this ever being accepted to anything. Um, as far as future directions, um, the, the biggest thing they would have to do would be to do some testing on real world tasks to make sure that it does actually correlate to benefits in real world tasks. And then also try to find a way to actually quantify the benefits shown by the evaluation method. Um, otherwise, that's it. Are there any questions?